Our last presenter for the day uh, is Nathan Fury, and Nathan is a postdoctoral fellow at UBC's um, Pacific Salmon Conservation and Ecology Lab, and his work as part of the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project included doing uh, juvenile salmon migration studies. So Nathan, you're up. All right, thank you, Corey. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity. I apologize in advance for anyone who has comments or questions. I had a really long flight on Saturday, and my ears still have not cleared, so you, you're going to have to be loud. Um, but I'm really excited to give this talk, and we're actually going to kind of take a step back away from the Salish Sea. We'll, we'll still talk about the Salish Sea, uh, but we're going to look at a really neat model system that I think we can learn some lessons about uh, salmon smolt ecology that we need to think about and potentially apply to the Salish Sea. Before I get too far, there are a lot of folks, in addition to obviously the, the Pacific Salmon Foundation and the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project who have made this work possible, uh, including the Ocean Tracking Network. So again, speaking to some of the words that were said earlier, we're leveraging funds across multiple funding sources to get more work done. And I'm really, I'm just one person representing a really large team here. We have several incredible graduate students at UBC who are working on this. Uh, Scott Hinch is my supervisor. He's kind of the ringleader uh, of all of this work, but we are working with other universities. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Christy Miller's role at, at DFO in our research. And we also uh, have to thank Kintama, and we need to thank uh, the Honey Gatine First Nation for giving us access to the incredible field site uh, that I'll be talking about uh, for a lot of today's talk. So I know the Salish Sea Marine Survival Program is, or project is focused mostly on coho, chinook, and steelhead uh, because of their dramatic declines in the region, but we have to remember that, that the same is, can be said for Saka as well. Um, so there is still a need to, to understand what's going on uh, with Saka, and there might be some parallels that we could potentially draw. So our group since 2010 have been working up at Chilco Lake. And so Chilco Lake's shown by that red arrow there. It's kind of in the Caribou or Chilcotin region, a few hours west of Williams Lake, uh, to try to understand the migrations of juvenile sockeye salmon smolts as they go through these freshwater and then through the Salish Sea as well. It's a really good model system for a couple reasons. One, Chilco Lake sockeye is a huge population, and I'll speak to that in a second. Uh, but because of that, DFO actually considers it a reference population for all of the Fraser River watershed. So each spring, they install this river-wide counting fence to enumerate how many fish are going downstream. And we use that in a couple different ways, but most simply, it, it gives us really ac easy access to the fish. And so speaking of it being a very large population, I just wanted to play this short little clip. We're looking uh, downstream through that counting fence. And but over a four to five week period, we have anywhere from 10 to 50 million of these juvenile sockeye salmon smolts leave this lake and head downstream. So again, a really nice large population for us as researchers to be able to access fish and ask questions on a large wild population. And so I know this came up a little bit in the, in the video prior to the talks. Uh, but our group is using acoustic telemetry to understand the migrations. And just kind of to reiterate what this is, we're putting an electronic tag, we surgically implant it into the fish, and then we release it. And then we can use uh, what we call receivers or, or listening stations that we put throughout the freshwater environment as well as in the Salish Sea. And any time a fish goes by and gives off its signal within range of that receiver, we'll know when it happened and for what fish that happened. So we get individual histories for these fish throughout their migration. And so this has been the first time that this has ever been done on wild sockeye salmon smolts. And we're able to track them for nearly 1,100 kilometers through three river systems and through uh, the Strait of Georgia. Now, I'm not going to go through the results of, of kind of that broad work, but one of the take-home points was that consistently year after year, survival was the poorest in this specific landscape. So this is Chilco Lake on the right-hand side, uh, outletting into the Chilco River on the left-hand side. And every year, survival is poorer here. During this time of year, it's right before freshet, waters are relatively slow moving. They're also really clear. We also notice that the fish are only moving at night at this time. And so to us, these were all clues that these, these smolts might be uh, experiencing a high degree of predation. So we initiated a, a series of studies to look at one predator in particular to try to understand these relationships. 
and that's bull trout. So bull trout are a relatively large, uh, long-lived char species. They're native to the system. And, but what we notice is that every year we'd go to Chilco Lake and get, re get our tagging gear all set, and there would be dozens or even hundreds of these bull trout just sitting in uh, the lake outlet in the river, per, you know, right on time with us essentially, seemingly waiting for something. Uh, so we began to ask, well, are bull trout eating sockeye salmon smolts, and if so, how many? Well, the, the short answers to that are yes and quite a few. Um, so in this pan here, there are 56 uh, sockeye salmon smolts, and these are the contents from a single bull trout stomach. Uh, this is also not the record holder. Um, we, we had evidence of upwards of 100 smolts uh, in a single bull trout stomach. Uh, to put it in a, in a good way, and it's good, it seems everyone appears to be done with lunch. Um, but this is a, a stomach dissected out from bull trout, uh, donated to us by the Honey Gatine First Nation. And what you can see, it's actually jam-packed. Um, and you should be able to see a bunch of little sockeye salmon smolts in there. If you can't, I'll help you out. And so really the message here is that these bull trout are absolutely binge feeding on these sockeye salmon smolts. Even though the water is quite cold, they're still jamming as many smolts into their stomachs as they can. However, this, this begs a question because when I show this type of work to, to salmon people, uh, their immediate thoughts are, well, how do we reduce bull trout populations? How do we reduce exposure of the smolts to the bull trout? Uh, but we have to remember this is a native predator that's also of conservation concern to, to the province. Um, so we began to ask, well, what type of smolts are bull trout eating? Are they just picking out um, the strongest and the weakest fish at random? Or could they actually be, be selecting for certain types of smolts? And so we did a couple different things. First, we just we examined the contents that we pull out of the bull trout stomach and look at the size of these smolts. But we also teamed up with Dr. Christy Miller, who's a molecular ecologist over the Pacific Biological Station in Nanaimo. And she uses really fancy molecular techniques that are represented by that chip there. And we can actually dissect these smolts from a bull trout stomach and assess them for several dozen different pathogens or disease-causing agents in salmon that are known to infect salmon worldwide. So we can essentially screen the health of these fish that we pull out of a bull trout stomach as well as that we pull out of the population at random. A couple of take home points. Consistently year in and year out bull trout are selecting for smaller smolts. Um, so if you're a smaller fish you're more likely to end up in a bull trout stomach than if you're a larger fish and we saw this in every single year of our study and we also see this uh, with other predators in the Salish Sea with sockeye particularly birds such as rhinoceros auklets. We also saw in one year in which the, the infection was, was present, we actually found that smolts with a specific virus, infectious hematopoietic necrosis virus, that's been known to be in this system for at least 70 years, um, if you were infected with IHN, you were 10 to 20 times more likely to end up in a bull trout stomach uh, than you were to be found in the general population. So it might be that these bull trout are effectively pulling out some of the weakest fish before they can go downstream, before they meet up with a lot of the other populations uh, when they get into the main stem Fraser and then out to the Salish Sea. Okay, so if you're a smolt though, and let's say you're a healthy smolt, it still doesn't sound good because you have hundreds of bull trout waiting to, just waiting at this lake outlet for you. So what are, what are the ways that you can maximize your own chances of survival? Well, in that video that I showed you, again, this is a really large population, a lot of fish. One of our oldest hypotheses about migrations of any animal, uh, including salmon, is that they synchronize the migration so that they can increase their density so they can effectively swamp or numerically overwhelm predators. It doesn't matter how many predators are there. If you can run enough fish by them, uh, you can survive. However, this is really hard to test in ecology. Uh, particularly for salmon in the Salish Sea, because there's a lot of variables. However, at Chilco, we can do exactly this. We can test this hypothesis because of this DFO counting fence. From this counting fence, we get five-minute counts on how many sockeye salmon are initiating their migration downstream. And then we can compare that to the information that we get from our acoustic telemetry. That effectively allows us to ask the question, does a tagged fish who travels with a lot of friends, hundreds of thousands of other sockeye salmon, have a better chance of surviving than a tagged fish that only travels with a handful? 
And I'm not going to walk you through the figure here, but we do see very strong evidence of this, such that if a tagged smolt initiates its downstream migration with uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of, of, of other sockeye salmon smolts, they have a really good chance of survival. If they go out by themselves, they have a very poor chance of survival. This is just a result from one year, but we've, in the past few months, we've gone back and assessed this over six years, and we see this same uh, relationship. So juvenile salmon can effectively swamp their predators if they have high enough densities when they outmigrate. And so this is a principle that we need to think about. Could that apply to other populations, other species, and to the other predators that, that might be influencing salmon uh, in the Salish Sea? Now, I don't want you to think that our group is ignoring the Salish Sea either. Um, so I did just want to take the last minute of my time to say that we are indeed tracking these fish all the way through the Strait of Georgia, as well as we've initiated other programs uh, that are more based in the Salish Sea. So for example, in 2015, we had a, student, a master's student, Steve Healy, who actually tagged fish from the Seymour River hatchery, Steelhead, and tracked their migration uh, through the Salish Sea. Let me just get this little guy going. There's a couple different colors that'll pop up. Those are just a couple different release groups that he used. Uh, but as you can see, we're able to track their migration for a few hundred kilometers. And one of the key findings that, that Steve found is that fish that use the most western route through the Discovery Islands, uh, Discovery Passage, had better survival than the fish that went through Subtle Channel. And we're repeating this on sockeye and over different years, and we are seeing um, some evidence that in certain years and for certain populations, the route that you take through this landscape could influence your survival. Now, why that happens and why doesn't it necessarily happen consistently in the same place every year, we're not sure. But it might indicate that there's some things going on at pretty fine spatial scales in the Salish Sea uh, that, that are pretty important. We've also initiated collaboration with the Hakai Foundation, or with Hakai Institute and the Tula Foundation to actually intercept sockeye salmon smolts in the Strait of Georgia around the Discovery Islands region, tag them there so we can increase the sample sizes of the fish and better understand routes through this region. And with that, I just want to say thank you and a couple take home points. A lot of times we're focused on just fish numbers. How do we get more fish in the Salish Sea? But we need to think about the timing of those fish going into, the, into an environment, as well as the condition of those fish. Um, and then also we're seeing with some of our marine work that routes through the Salish Sea are highly variable. And lastly, just there's my email as well as Scott's email if after this you don't have time and you wanna, you wanna bug me. So thank you guys.